Hey, wait, wait, wait. That was supposed to be me. I literally watched it count all the way down to zero, and Shauna even told me, she goes, you're the first thing up. Hey, who's excited to be here tonight? All right. Hey, I know we have a small crowd, and I know it's quarantine, uh, but if you're here in the room, thank you for being here. And then also, I want to give a shout out to anybody streaming online or watch, watching later. Thank you so much for tuning in. We've gathered for midweek. We're continuing with our theme called Make Your Move, which is focusing on God uh, you know, challenging us and inviting us to take action, not just to be listeners or you know, hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. So again, we're just super excited that you're here, and and we would love for you to join us as we sing uh, tonight. So let's get this thing started and let's sing together. All right, why do we all stand up? When I was searching, your love was never far. You made a way to get to me. You are the whisper leading me to your heart. Clearly Great treasure. 
pleasures that fade are never enough. You came along, oh, put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied.
you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory.
Nothing like something to kill the Jesus mood with a big Monopoly car. Yeah, that's, that's the right move. Right after a big praise and worship song, roll out a Monopoly car. We didn't think that one through. Hey, I just want to go ahead and say this. That song, uh, the lyrics of that are very relevant for tonight. All I did was praise you. All I did was worship. All I did was bow down. That's all I did. Hallelujah, you have saved me. You know, indicating that God does all the work and that we just stay still and we recognize the work of God in us supernaturally, and that is exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, you can almost view this, if you came on Sunday, as a continuation of Sunday's, or yeah, Sunday's message, uh, because we're talking about almost like the next step of that topic. Uh, now, you've arrived again for part number two, because this is once a month, midweek, part number two in this midweek series called Make Your Move, and today we're talking about Get Out of Jail Free. But before we do that, we're going to take just a moment, receive our offering, and talk to the people online and say, if you're here today and you're listening online, uh, you know, just pull out your phones or go to our app uh, or go to our website and uh, follow the prompts, and you will be able to give securely and safely. And if you're in the room and you want to give, uh, don't forget that there are some buckets on the way out as well, or you can just stay where you're at and use your phone as well. But thank you for giving and trusting Kensington and for um, just believing in what God has called us to. So uh, before we dive into it, let's pray together and let's ask God to be with us during our time together. Would you pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word and your truths. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear from you. Lord, thank you for your blessings in our lives, for always watching over us and taking care of us. And so, Father, we want to recognize your work in our lives tonight, Uh, not in our own efforts, not because of us, but because of you. We are here tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. All right. Well, listen, I want to go ahead and first of all tell you that uh, the series is based on Monopoly, and and I know that there are people, I took a survey last month, there are most people who can take or leave the game of Monopoly. Uh, I like Monopoly. I'm not going to bore you with any type of Monopoly stories uh, except for one, and that is... And that is, uh, many of you know this if you were here on Sunday, but I did a Monopoly reunion because we have a group, a Monopoly group in high school, and 30 years later we did a Monopoly reunion. Uh, in high school, whoever won the, the most Monopoly games at the end of an entire year got to win a, and carry a trophy with them for the rest of their lives. And so when we went down for this reunion, um, they all begged me to re-up the original trophy. They said, you have to re-up it. And so I have the trophies over here, so I brought them for you tonight. So here's what happened. I've had this 
this tiny little trophy with me for 30 years. I'm not kidding, 30 years. And, and it's just a golf trophy that we snipped the golf thing off and we just wrote the word Monopoly. And so it was high school. So we ended up uh, having that. Well, then I'm thinking Mop, Monopoly Reunion. I go out and I bought this. I spent like 40 bucks on it. So I wrote Monopoly Reunion Trophy. And they all begged me and they said, no, you have to re-up your original trophy. And I'm like, nobody does that for the Olympics. They win a gold medal, they get to keep it. What are you talking about? And they're like, no, you have to re-up it. And so anyway, I'll show you one photo. Here it is. And that is, um, so there's me sleeping with the trophy. Dave's trying to stab me. And there's us, and there's me, and there's the 30-year Monopoly reunion. So I'll just bore you with one quick story, and that is this. I had the orange property and boardwalk and park place, and Dave Davis had everything else. And he had, he had like uh, one, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven hotels, uh, on the upper and lower rows, and I was losing, I was down to one house, and miraculously, a series of events took place, and that's what won me the game. And so, I, so never give up. There you go. There's the, there's the theory. <laughs> never give up. I was down to, like, literally, I was facing 12, 11 hotels. I had one house on boardwalk, and a series of events took place, and it was awesome. So, uh, the whole point is, is that monopoly is like life, and, what, and I've said this before, and I took my illustration from the Apostle Paul, because if the Apostle Paul can compare the Christian life to a race to run to win, then certainly I'm allowed to take another sport, and yes, monopoly is a sport, and I could just say, hey, it's play to win, and so last month we talked about what does it take to play to win. Well, if you go around Monopoly, it's like life, isn't it? It's like another day, another dollar. You go around, go get another paycheck. It's another, you know, clock in, clock out kind of a day. And then, you know, you go through life trying to pay your bills and, you know, just trying to get through, you know, the board without having to declare bankruptcy and, you know, and just you know, get through life without being afraid. And a lot, of, a lot of the ways, in a lot of ways, that's the way Monopoly is. Well, there's a space on Monopoly that's the harshest space more than any other space, and it's this one right here. Okay, it's, it's this space right here. It says, go to jail. And not only is it the harshest space with the harshest punishment, but they tell you to go there in the harshest way. Because look how this reads. It says, go directly to jail, as if, as if you know, you, you, you weren't going to jail already. And then it, not only does it tell you where to go, but it tells you what you're not going to do. You're not going to pass go, and you're not going to collect $200. Well, here's the parallel. The parallel is this, that that space interrupts you. Because you have, a, you have an agenda, you have a goal, you're going through life, and all of a sudden you hit a space that interrupts you. And what it does is it holds you back, and, and, it, and it actually interrupts you know, your, your flow, and, and it causes you to pause, and then you're stuck in this place, and you can't get out unless it's either you know, just by chance, or it's going, to be, it's going to cost you something. Now, the reason why that's so relevant for us is because uh, there's, there's another thing in life that, that symbolizes going to jail, and you only get out of it either by chance or it's going to cost you something. I don't know if you know this or not, but your pastor has been to jail uh, a couple different times, okay? I was actually in juvenile. When I was younger, I, I broke curfew, and the police officers arrested us because we were being sassy, and we laughed at him. We ran over a curb. I laughed at him. He's like, get in the back, and he waited till four in the morning just to call my mom, and Jeff was with me. Uh, he was in the photo, and Jeff, Jeff's dad was really mad at four in the morning, comes really angry, and then my parents walk in, and they just laugh. They go, oh, Chris, you're so funny. And they pick me up, and so... Um, um, and that was, you know, that was my family. And then, and then the other time is I got arrested as a youth pastor in Orlando in Universal Studios for shoplifting. Hey, do me a favor. Raise your hand if, you've, if you did not know that. Raise your hand if you did not know that I get arrested. And oh my goodness, that's like 80% of the room. Really? I always pretend or I always assume that everybody's heard my stories before. I told this story about three years ago. I promise I'll make it very, very fast. But I, went, I took about 60 college students down to Orlando uh, Universal Studios. And I remember it was raining, pouring. And this was like, like late 90s. And I was stuck in a gift shop and it was just rain. And, and, and it was just packed. And back then we didn't have cell phones. We had walking talkies and I was trying to be connected with all my volunteers and students but I was stuck all by myself just got off the Terminator ride and I'm stuck in this in this thing and so I'm walking around the shop like everybody is and I and I was holding like a Spider-Man mug and a, a baseball and I was holding these couple items well after like 45 minutes of rain I got tired of holding them and I had this bag from the Terminator souvenir shop so I thought I'll just take these items and place them in my bag because it's more convenient that way, and then I'll remember to pay for them on the way out. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? That's not what happened. So I, I, did, I, so I put them in the bag. Now, here's the only reason why they believed me somewhat. 
is because on the way out, I actually stopped, and this guy was doing a winky blinky toy. It was like an electronic toy for like $40. And so I was like, ooh, I'll grab one of those. And I took it to the counter, and I purchased a $40 item. The items in my bag totaled up to be $12. What thief is going to purchase a $40 item on their credit card with their identity and then try to steal 12 bucks worth of things? So eventually they believed me. That didn't stop my arrest. So here's what happens. So I ended up paying for the winky blinky thing, and then I started to walk out because it stopped raining, and all of a sudden, I felt two people grabbing my arms on either side. Now, when you're a minister of high school students and college students, what, what do you normally think? They, they harass you. They always grab. So I, I haven't seen anybody for 45 minutes. I'm immediately thinking, oh, there's some guys ready to tackle me. You know, they're my students. So I grabbed somebody's arm, and I tried to flip them. <laughs> and it was a policeman. And I grabbed him, and I go, oh, like this. And before I knew it, I was down on the ground, and he had his he hand on the back of my head, and, he was, and he's like, stay down, stay down. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm like, ow, this kind of hurts. And he's like, stay down, because obviously I was resisting arrest. And, and, and he's like, stay down. And, and all of a sudden, uh, he goes, we've been watching you. And I looked up, and I go, you've been watching me? What are you talking about? He said, we know, we've been watching you. And then all of a sudden, I remembered, and I go, Oh, and then the other one goes, eh. you know, and I was like, oh my goodness. So they grabbed me, they have a, like a jail there. They stuck me there, clink, clink, I'm, I have bars. And I'm like, and I'm just, I'm like, hey, I'm a youth pastor. And he goes, and he looks at me and I've got like this backwards hat, I'm unshaven. He looks, he's like, you're not a youth pastor. I'm like, I'm a youth pastor. I'm here with college students and high school students. And he's like, no, you're not. And so finally they ended up after like three hours, they're like, we're gonna escort you off the property. Well, he believed me eventually. And then I said, hey, uh, the, the vehicle that you're escorting me off is a school bus. I'm the driver of a school bus. I'm like, do you really want to escort me off? And so they believed me. And so they let me stay in City Walk, the public place. And I was there for like 14 hours. And I had to wait for my kids sitting there all by myself in the Hard Rock Cafe. So the point is, is that I was technically arrested. And by the way, side note, they told me I was not able to return to any Disney properties or Universal Studio properties because they have face recognition. And I would be immediately arrested and go to jail. And then I had to pay a lawyer $500 to take care of it. So the point is, is that I have been to jail, so I know what it's like. So when life gets hard, you may actually have, you know, been placed in a temporary jail. Chances are you have not, okay? But there's a moment when you realize that life is difficult. Now, it's one thing to be in a physical jail but, and, and realize that there's not, no way out, but it's another thing entirely to feel like you are living a life where the struggle is real and you are in jail spiritually. So let me go ahead and just take a look at a few things that tell us that we're in jail spiritually. Number one, I'm going to reference Romans chapter 8. If you read it, it tells us that we live in a world that's broken and full of sin. In fact, Romans 8 is pretty depressing but it, because it paints a reality that explains to us that all of us live under the bondage of decay, of sin, and that we live in this broken world and that life is hard. Uh, the, the book of Isaiah tells us that even our righteousness are like filthy rags compared to a sinless God. In fact, Romans chapter 3, verse number 23 is on the screen, and it reads this way. It says, for everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So the very first thing we have to realize about going to jail is that our sin keeps us from God in terms of eternity. It keeps us from God. And so we need God in order to get to heaven, in order to you know, live a life with him. Our sin separates us from that. And so in a lot of ways, uh, our, our sin is like, are like shackles in a prison. But not only does our sin keep us from God when it comes to our salvation, but it can also keep us from God when it comes to our daily lives. Because after all, once we receive Christ, once we trust Christ, and we are assured a home in heaven with certainty based on the promises of God, it does not mean that our lives will be sin-free. My college professor always used to say, you know, this old wise dude, he said, oh, we could never be sinless, but we can sin less. I'm like, oh, you're so clever, Dr. Seuss. But, but, but the point is, is that, you know, all of us try our very best to go through life and we try to, you know, uh, either get over or conquer or be delivered from uh, the sin in our lives. And I know that sin is not a popular word. I know that. Uh, there, are, there are people that would uh, change the word and they would say bad habits or mistakes. 
But just for the sake of tonight, I just want to let you know the Bible calls it sin. And sin is anything that keeps us from God. And, 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 it, and because we're all sinful, uh, it is just hard to avoid in life. So here's what I'm going to do in just a second. Not, not now, but just in a second. Uh, in a second, when I call for it, there's going to be something on the screen that I'm going to read through, and it's a series of statements. And really, the series of statements represents struggles. And, and it's really resulting in just the brokenness and decay that we find ourselves in. It's the reality of this world. Now, here's what I want you to do. I do not want you to give any indication that you uh, subscribe to any one of these statements. However, I do want you to tell yourself when I read a statement that, uh, that you would say that you, uh, you agree with. So in other words, let me say it a different way. When I say, like, I feel alone, that's a statement, I feel alone, I would just want you to just, just tell yourself by either tapping yourself where nobody could see or just clenching your fist or squeezing your hand. And just because when you tell yourself, this is me, there's something powerful when it comes to that. And facing reality is something that God often calls us to do because without facing the reality of the condition that we're in and the sin that we have to actually struggle with and face, you know, we, we, we can't appreciate or understand or even receive in some cases the deliverance of God. And so it's okay. It's okay to be real. After all, one of our values at Kensington is authenticity or leading from brokenness. So let me put this list up and I'm going to read it out loud. So I feel alone. And you can just tell yourself that if, that's, if you agree with it. No one would love me if they knew what I've done. How about I hate how I look? I've used food to cope either restrictively or excessively. I'm depressed. I can't overcome the sin in my life. I've thought about suicide. My identity is based upon the success or, uh, or future of my children. I feel like I don't have any friends. I regularly drink too much. I've had panic attacks. I worry for the well-being of my child. I keep breaking promises with God. I've intentionally hurt myself physically. I feel shame about something I cannot share. And I have lost control of my anger or behavior. And that's a sobering list. And when you read something like that in front of a crowd or whether you're listening online, you know, you're like, whoa, the mood changed. And, and the reality is, is whenever you're trying to tackle the subject of feeling like you're in shackles, right? When, you've, when you're actually going to really truly dig into and really embrace the theme of go to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200, that represents the things in our lives that say, whoop, it's going to hold you back. You're not going any further. Sometimes you can't even get out of bed. And whatever it is that you struggle with, whatever it is that you feel like you can't get over, whatever it is that you seem to seek deliverance from, you know, it, it really comes down to the fact that the word sin represents the imperfections and the depravity of us. And so if you were here Sunday, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and how when God, when we receive Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit comes in and it's actually a it's a power that, that is able to deliver us from all things. Well, tonight, we're going to be looking at a scripture of somebody who is actually in jail physically. And it's the story of Paul and Silas. And before I dive into the scripture, I want to give you a little context. Paul and Silas were in the city of Philippi. And they were walking through the city and they were being followed by a woman who was possessed with a demon that allowed her to tell people's fortunes. And so this woman was following Paul and Silas, and they were actually going to prayer. That's what they were doing. They were on their way to, to pray. And the woman was following behind them and shouting and, and, and telling everybody with an earshot, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Now, if that's a new word for you, I know that's a word that's attached to church. You must be saved. That word literally means to be rescued. And, and, and the reason why it, it's, it's worded that way is because it represents being rescued from sin. Now, that's an important term because it comes later in our story. But this woman is telling everybody, these men have come to tell everyone how to be saved. And then what ends up happening is Paul turns around and he says to the woman, demon, come out of this woman. And the demon does. And the woman is healed and she can no longer tell the fortune. And the masters who actually, you know, were, had this woman, you know, work for them, they were upset because she made them a lot of money. 
And so because they were upset because Paul took away their source of income, uh, they actually, you know, started a ruckus and they drew a crowd and a mob. And then the officials came and they beat Paul and Silas severely and they threw them into, into prison with the expressed instruction that they are not to escape from jail. So the jailer puts them in not just in the dungeon, but the inner dungeon, and they put their legs in stocks. So here's where we pick up in Acts chapter 16. Look at verse number 22. It says, A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods. And they were severely beaten. And my guess is, if the Bible says you're severely beaten, then that's pretty accurate. And then they were thrown into prison. And of course, that's our theme for tonight, being in jail. And then it goes on and says, the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So keep in mind, those are his specific orders. And the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. And it says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Now, two things about this. Number one, I highlighted they were singing and praying because I don't know about you, but I don't know if you've ever received a severe beating. I received a lot of beatings, uh, both friendly and non-friendly, but I'm not sure they could be qualified as severe. But if I've ever, you know, if you've ever received a severe beating, I'm not sure that your reaction would be to sing hymnals. Uh, maybe pray, maybe, but in terms of singing, who does that? And I love how the scripture says that they were singing and, and, and they were praying, but then it says, and the other prisoners were listening. It doesn't have to include that information, but it does because that's important information. And then it goes on and says this. In verse number 26, it says, suddenly, and I highlighted that only for one reason, because I love the drama in God's word. Suddenly, it's a movie, isn't it? And it's like, suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner, not just Paul, not just Silas, but every person who was either accused or perhaps even convicted of a crime, both small and probably large, every single one of them, their chains fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. And it says he assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Why would he kill himself? Well, because he was given the orders, and had he, you know, been faced with, uh, you know, the fact that he let every prisoner escape, obviously, uh, he knew that his life was going to, he was going to lose his life. It was probably not going to be as swift as taking out his own sword and killing himself. So, um, I don't know why, but I have this massive sword that weighs like 20 pounds in, in my bedroom as a prop. I'm not even sure where I got it, but it is super, super heavy. Let me see if I can get it to make the right sound. Hang on. Did it make it? Did it? Okay. And this thing is really, this, this thing's really heavy. And I can't even imagine uh, entering into a battle and have this be your main weapon. And I mean, this thing's massive. And, I, and, and somebody might say, well, how do you kill yourself? Do you, do, you, do you try to like one, like two? Do you chop off your head? How do you kill yourself with such a sword? Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. So if the camera could follow, and you're, you're on. Okay, follow me. Here's what they would do. Is they would, they would lodge the, the sword up against uh, a corner of, you know, some place, or if they were in a field, it would be against a rock. And then what they would do is they would thrust the weight of their body onto the sword and ram it through their heart, and they would fall on their sword. Now, I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's how they would kill themselves. They would fall on their sword. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard the, torn, the term, just fall on your sword? This is where it comes from. Because, because prisoners, think about it. We use it for, hey, do something to yourself intentionally, and we use it for terms like say you're sorry or admit that you're wrong. Just fall on your sword and do, you know, do this to yourself intentionally to say you're sorry. Well, that's what a, a warrior would do. Why would a warrior, be, you know, who has a sword and, you know, 99% of the time use it for offense, 0.9%, I'm assuming, and then under the most extreme conditions, turn the sword on himself. He would fall on his sword only if he absolutely had to. And yet today, we use the term fall on your sword, uh, and, and that's really where it comes from. So, so the jailer took out his sword, and he was about to fall on it. Now, what's so interesting about this is that you would think that, I mean, I could understand if Paul and Silas were to stick around for this event to make sure that the prisoner guard didn't hurt himself, but actually everybody stuck around. 
And so let me just go ahead and first of all say this. Before I move on with this story, um, let me give you, there's three sentences for tonight, and here's the first realization. The first realization is this, that they were delivered from their chains supernaturally, not from their own effort. The reason why I love this is because God's word has a lot of symbolism. It has a lot of things to draw parallels from. And I believe that in a lot of ways, the way God works today is the way that he works back then. And you know what? I love the symbolism in here because just as they were freed from a physical prison, supernaturally, not in their own effort, I believe that's the way that God frees us from our sin. And we have to look at it that way. I mean, after all, when we ask God to deliver us from an addiction, when we ask God to deliver us from the struggle that we've had of anger our whole lives, or perhaps, you know, our, our, our attitudes, or the things that, you know, just the, the, the depravity that, that, that we battle with, and we say, God, please help me get over this. Help me have a different attitude. Help deliver me from this habit or this temptation or this desire. Change my heart. We have to realize that there's a certain amount of effort from us. After all, Paul and Silas did pray. We don't know what they prayed. They perhaps prayed specifically for uh, what happened to happen. So they certainly put in their own effort. But yet they were completely incapable of being delivered from that jail. And I want you to know this, that doctrinally and theologically, every single time that God delivers you from something, it is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. So don't, don't be, you know, don't be uh, giving yourself a lot of credit Right, because we could do our part. We could dedicate, we could you know, make a determination or a statement of resolve and say, I'm gonna make sure that I go to church from now on or, or, or stop this habit or do this or overcome this. And certainly our efforts are there. But if God were to completely remove that from your life and deliver you, please make no mistake of it. It is a supernatural work that is not from you, but from him. And I think it's worth mentioning tonight. Then in verse number 28, it says this, but Paul shouted to him, he's shouting to the jailer, stop, don't kill yourself, for we are all here. And I I highlighted that because that means every prisoner is there, which is unusual, isn't it? Why in the world would everybody else stick around? Why wouldn't they all run? I mean, you know, Paul and Silas, they care about the man. And and think about this, They, they had every reason to assume that God was delivering them out of that prison. They had every reason to assume that God freed them for the purpose of running. And yet, just following their instincts, maybe perhaps just following, you know, just who they were as people, they decide to, you know, make this man's physical and spiritual salvation more important than their very freedom and perhaps even their very lives. And so it says, we are all here. And then it says, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he asked the question that he had heard the prophet talk about them. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? So falling down, falling down there's, there's, an obvious, uh, there's an obvious response to the jailer have, having seen this supernatural deliverance. And I believe that what's true then is still true now, and it's the second realization for tonight. And that is a supernatural deliverance gets the attention of everyone in jail, right? And and you know what I mean by jail? I mean everyone who stands up at Celebrate Recovery and says, God delivered me from this. Those who wander in on the very first day who have absolutely no victory over their lives, who are are slaves to addiction and need to depend on God, they, they walk in and they're like, hey man, I'm still in jail. You say that you've been supernaturally delivered and I'm telling you, this is the place I need to be because I need whatever it is that you've discovered. And of course, the answer is that I didn't do anything. I've prayed, I've depended on God. I've asked him and he's the one that has supernaturally delivered me from this sin or whatever it is in our lives. And so, you know, again, it gets the attention of everyone here in jail, including the Roman guard. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's amazing to me to think of uh, Paul and Silas sticking around and taking this chance. And not only that, but this is probably the jailer who perhaps even physically beat Paul with a wooden rod. And if he didn't beat Paul, he's the one that ordered it. So ultimately, he's the captain of the guard. He's the one responsible for it. Um, 
So let me tell you something. I've always shared with you that I've had a, a rough background. So I, I came from, you know, I grew up in a, in a home that wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, rosy. So, you know, we, we grew up very poor and, uh, you know, alcoholism was a part of our family. We owned a bar and everything else. However, some things that I really uh, don't share very often, and that is this. Even though that I grew up with my share of struggles, um, I, I was actually, you know, pretty happy as a kid. Our family had a, an incredible amount of fun. Uh, regardless of our struggles. Um, not only that, but I was actually really cocky and confident, you know, as if that might be a surprise to you. You know, like I just, I just thought like, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a decent athlete. I was always on the dean's list. I was always top of my class as far as, you know, grades go. Um, I, I, I thought that I did okay with trying to get a date. I, I was uh, decently popular. I tried my very best to hide all my struggles. And I actually thought at the time when I was going through life that I had a lot of confidence and a lot of reason not to be either ashamed or have trouble. And so if you would have said to me, hey, is your life, you know, do you need God in your life? Do you need Jesus? I would have said, no, not at all. My life's great. And, and I really wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said, uh, I wouldn't have described my life back then the way that I look back at my life and describe it to you. Does that make sense? Because I, in, the, in the moment, I just, I thought that everything was fine. But yet I remember the time when I walked into church and I realized something was deep inside of me that wasn't right. And, I, and again, I've told you this story before, if you've been around a while, that I got invited to church by, by the guy in, in, the, in the photo. <clears throat> and I remember walking up the stairs of, of the, this group called the Varsity Group. It was just a, a high school group in a church. And I remember walking up through the door and there was a door that was opened and, and, and the whole door was a piece of paper and they used to draw clip art on there and they would promote like different things and it was the series. So the whole door <clears throat> had this kid slouched over and he had a dark cloud above his head. And then the title of the series was, If God Loves Me, Then Why Don't I Like Myself? And I remember seeing that. And even though I've always felt like, you know, I had everything and everything was fine in my life, I just remember seeing that going, uh, why does that resonate with me? Like, why, does, why, why is that drawing me in? And I wanted to know the answer to that. Because deep down inside, I knew that something wasn't wrong. And the truth is, I struggled with more than one thing on that list that I read out loud. And I felt like I was in jail in a lot more ways than one. So let's finish the story. So he asks Paul, what should I do to be saved? And then in verse number 31, both Paul and Silas replied, believe, that's it, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, along with everyone in your household. They all have an opportunity to do so. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. So by this time, it's after midnight, and the jailer, who is responsible for their wounds, is caring for them, which demonstrates complete repentance. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, which is one of the greatest honors. Imagine bringing uh, a prisoner that you were responsible for into your house, treating them with honor. And it says, then he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. And so here's the third truth for today, and that is this, that I believe that God is calling many of us to, to get out of jail free tonight by believing and trusting Jesus. So I just have to believe that when I was reading through that list that some of you were thinking, that's what I struggle with. Perhaps you resonated with a comment that said, you know, I, I keep on breaking promises to God or I can't overcome a sin in my life. Or maybe it is perhaps, maybe you're here and you don't know God as your savior. I don't want to assume that the 120 people in here and maybe the, you know, however many are going to watch this online or listening right now. I don't want to assume that everybody knows Christ, that everybody believes in him, that everybody's a Christian. So maybe, maybe sin is keeping you from God and the jail that you're in tonight represents your eternity. Or maybe it's just something that's in your life that represents, you know, it's just keeping you back from your relationship with your heavenly father. And whenever you tackle the topic of sin, it's a heavy and sober topic. But I believe that God is calling us tonight to get out of jail free. 
And you know what I love about this illustration, if I can continue on with the Monopoly theme, is that there's always this card right here. Whenever you land on it, right, get out of jail free. This card may be kept until needed or sold. And it says get out of jail free because you don't have to pay for it. So if you have this card, no longer do you have to depend on chance from getting you out of jail. No longer is it going to cost you anything. And and I would say that the, the illustration rings true all the way to the end. Because Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin. Whatever your deficiency, whatever your hang up, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whenever you think about the sin in your life and you feel bad about it, hopefully you do a little bit because a little bit of feeling bad is good, although we're not supposed to live under guilt. That is not how God wants us to live. But there is a thing called conviction. Paul says repent. And by the way, the word repent literally means to turn away from and to turn the other way. That's what the word means. To, To repent and then to believe. And by believing and trusting in Christ, then, then I believe that that is the way that, that all of us are going to recognize, listen, Jesus is the one that supernaturally delivers us from whatever it is that we continually struggle with. Well, let, me, let me read it this way. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2. It says, therefore, meaning chapter 11 is all these great examples of men, of, and, men and women of faith. So in light of that, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So this is Paul using the Christian life as a race. That's where I took my liberties from with the the game board. But he actually says, "Let let us take away the sin that so easily entangles us. Let me pause there and say this. For everybody in this room, it's different. It's different. Like my, my struggle could be radically different than your struggle. And whatever you struggle with, I could say, ha ha, God delivered me f- you know, from that a long time ago. But every single person in here can resonate with that statement. The sin that so easily trips you up, what is it in your life that you could identify that you would say, Gee, gosh, if God could just deliver me from this one thing. And then it sounds like he's saying it so flippantly, doesn't it? Just throw it off and run the race. But he's actually about to tell us how to do that. So he goes on and say this. He says, let us run the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, like like blinders of a horse, right? To look at Jesus solely with our eyes fixed on Jesus straight straight away, looking to him for wisdom and strength and miracles and dependence and deliverance. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And then it says, for the joy set before him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I love the writer of Hebrews, how he talks about, let us throw off the weights or the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run the race that God has called us to, and let's do it by fixing our eyes on Jesus. And then he turns around and says, for Jesus had his eyes fixed on the joy set before him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Paul is making a direct comparison. He's saying in the same way that you should fix your eyes on Jesus in order to accomplish what it is that you know that God is calling you to, do it in the same way that Jesus did it. For the joy set before him, he actually had his eyes fixed on that, and and he actually had his eyes set on uh, the joy set before him, enduring the cross, scorning its shame. And so here's the question. What was the joy set before him? What what, what joy could possibly come out of Jesus dying on a cross? So Jesus enduring physical pain as 100% man and 100% God, you know, praying that God, if there's any other way, please, you know, have it be that way. Let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Enduring the absolute torture of the cross, and yet he endured it, how? By focusing and fixing his eyes on the joy set before him. What is the only joy set before him through the cross? And you know what the answer is? It's you. And it's me. It's the salvation of humanity. Jesus knew why he had to die. And he died to pay the price for your sin and my sin. And so Paul is saying in the same way that Jesus had his eyes fixed on you, that we should have our eyes fixed on him the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so even though that he mentions just tossing our sin that so easily entangles us aside, it's actually not that easy. But it is when we realize 
that Jesus had his eyes fixed on us and that we should have our eyes fixed on him. And by doing so, we recognize that it's only God that could supernaturally deliver us from whatever affliction that we're struggling with. Because when we recognize the work of Christ in our lives, then every single time we're faced with the temptation, we will, we will completely go back and depend on the supernatural deliverance of God in every moment that we're tempted. Now, before I close, I want to go ahead and say this. Uh, I don't want to assume that everybody here knows Christ. And so I want to share one last verse with you, and it's the most famous verse in all the Bible. It's John chapter 3, verse 16, and it reads this way. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And by the way, I'm going to leave, leave that up there for a minute, Jill. The four things you need to understand is that God loved you and that God gave his son. And that's the only thing you need to know on how to get to heaven. And the only thing you need to do on getting to heaven is you need to believe. And once you do, then you'll have. And you'll have eternal life. The only thing you need to know and understand tonight is that God loved and God gave. And if you believe, then you receive. And so if you're here today and maybe perhaps that is your cell that you find yourself in and the shackles that, you know, with, with the question that torments you, how do I get to heaven when I die? Just know that just with simply, uh, simple trust by believing and trusting in Christ. So here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to pray on both ends for those who want to trust Christ, for those who want to, uh, you know, trust Christ for the thing that they want to be delivered from, the sin that keeps us from him, on both, on both sides of the equation. Um, before I pray, let me say one last thing. And that is, when I uh, decided to spend my life in ministry, it was my junior year of high school. And I was at a camp, a summer camp. And so it was literally the summer before my senior year of high school. And I remember the speaker who stood up there. And, uh, and uh, if I thought hard enough, I could come up with his name, Randy. Uh, Randy uh, something. But Randy had a big old mustache. And I remember Randy, I could still see him in his white shirt, and he actually posed a question on like the third night of camp. And here's what he said. He said, if you feel like God's asking you to do something, let me ask you a question. Why not today? That was the question. Why not today? He's like, what's so special about tomorrow? The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Today, right now, this moment, it doesn't have to be a special moment where you're, you, know, you're, you have a big ceremony or a party or your family's gathered around. Why not today? Why can't September 16th be the day that God delivers you supernaturally? And not because of anything you do. You could do your part. You can pray. You can ask him. But just to expect and believe that God is going to just intervene and give you the supernatural deliverance from whatever it is that you're struggling with. Why not today? And I remember hearing that. And I remember thinking, yeah, why not today? I mean, it's only the rest of my life. It's only my career. <laughs> Why not? And so I remember getting up and going to the front and, and, and praying with somebody. And they said, why did you come up? And I said, I think I'm called to be a pastor. And he's like, wow, are you kidding me? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, and he's like, what, you came up today? I'm like, why not today? And that was, that was the beginning of my journey. Because I, I felt like that's what God was calling me to do. And so at the end of that night, uh, we went back to the dorms. We all did our devotions. We went to sleep. And of course, I snuck out. You know, we weren't supposed to. But I remember laying on the field, looking up, and there was no lights around, no city lights. We're out in the middle of nowhere, and there's a huge amount of stars. I mean, it was just amazing. And back then, we sang hymnals. And I remember thinking of How Great Thou Art. And the lyrics of How Great Thou Art is, Oh, Lord, my God, when I uh, consider all the worlds thy hands have made, uh, I see the stars, and I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And I remember just thinking about that, looking at up all the stars. And I was singing it, and I was all by myself on this hill, you know. It was a big cross on the hill, and there's like a lake below, you know. And I sang the chorus, and I sang, Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And then, I, you know, I drew at the end, you know, if you ever heard that hymnal. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. And then I went, how great thou art. And I stopped, and there was a shooting star that went, I, I kid you not. And I was like, wow. And then I finished, how great thou art. And then, and then I thought, God gave me a shooting star to confirm today was the day. 
So I got up and I went back into my cab and I woke up my youth pastor and I said, hey, I said, let me tell you a story. And I told him the story about the song. And I said, I'm singing it. I said, right at the, right at the crescendo, right, perfect timing, whew, star. And, and, then, and then my youth pastor said, so you think that God put that star in right at the right time in the middle of your song to confirm your decision tonight? I said, yeah, why not? He said, well, just consider this then. How far that star was and how long that God, God had to have the perfect timing for that star to burn out and then, and then shoot across the sky and light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So how long did it have to take to get to you to where you can see it to time it perfectly right on the crescendo of your song? He's like, that's how awesome God is. And I thought, wow. <laughs> but here's what I do believe. I do believe that When God calls us to believe and trust him and we know that he's calling us that and we're supposed to give up whatever it is that we know God wants us to give up, if we just recognize that it's we're just gonna do our tiny little part and we're gonna depend on the supernatural deliverance of God, he shows up in little ways like that, doesn't he? And you have stories and I know you do and I have stories where God shows up in little ways and confirms to us Yes, it is him trying to get our attention. It is him that's calling us to himself. And so if God is calling you to get out of jail tonight, I would just say, why not today? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. I thank you for this moment. I pray if there's anybody in here who doesn't know for certain that they would go to heaven when they died, I pray, Lord, that we would put our belief and trust in you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a home in heaven. And for those of us in here who want to and need to, I pray, Lord, that we would do our very best to invite you into our life, to invite you into our hearts. And Father, to trust in you. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross and giving us a home in heaven. And so we put our belief and trust in you tonight. For those of us in here who already know you and perhaps even have known you for a long time, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be supernaturally delivered from whatever it is that you're calling us to tonight. Whatever it is we need to walk away from, whatever harsh decision we need to make, perhaps, whether involving a bad relationship or a bad habit or something that we struggle with, Father, help us to look to you and depend on you and to recognize that you are the one who gives us the power in our lives to do a supernatural work to deliver us from whatever sin that ails us. Thank you for paying the price for our sins. Thank you for dying on the cross and wiping our sins as far as the east is from the west, burying them in the deepest sea, making our sins as white as snow, though they were red as scarlet. And Father, help us to see the evidence of your calling in our lives. Father, help us to recognize it is you who are calling us. So send us a song on the radio, send us a friend, send us a verse. Send us, Father, the, the, the power of your Holy Spirit through prayer that we may know and understand, Lord, that you are alive and that you want to deliver us today, not tomorrow, right now. For we ask and we pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.
Praise the name of Jesus for sure. Hey, we can't make it through this life without him, can we? And I'm telling you, if you have any questions at all about getting to heaven, if you have any questions about eternity or perhaps things you're struggling with, I'll be out in the lobby and anyone on our staff would love to talk with you before you head on out. Uh, I just want to encourage you uh, to come back on Sunday. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, I hope that you're encouraged. When God calls us to make our move, it, it, it insinuates actions. I believe that God wants us to respond when we're confronted with his truths. So I pray that that's where our hearts are and what we're thinking about. So thank you so much for being here. I love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.